Okay, do it yourself camera stand because it's almost 10 in the morning and you're just really, really lazy. It's snowing outside, you're cuddled up next to your perfect buddy. And you just feel like you want to talk about something just for the sake of talking about something. Um, it's going to look really awkward over there. Let me just... There we go. It's okay, Bella. You know what? It's going to be a weird angle, but what, but what the hell? It's a weird book. Um, okay, so I finished reading Ready Player One last night, and instead of doing a movie review, I'm going to be talking about a book. Um, yeah, because there's a movie coming up. It makes sense to talk about the literary version. Just make sure I'm not sitting on you. Um, and I just feel like... There's, okay, from what I understand, and I could be right or wrong, there's two, three, or four sides here. You have those that have read the book and really like it and, you know, put it on a pedestal and stuff, and then you have those who, excuse me, um, read it and really don't like it. And I've read many articles, I've seen many... Sorry, I scoffed my breakfast earlier. Um, I've just read a lot about it. And the opinions from what I've been hearing are rather mixed. So I figured I'd just give my two cents out there. Um, because you have that my because you have that group that's just like, it's great, it's amazing, it's the holy rail of geekdom! And then you have the other side that's like, it's crap, man. Crap, 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 crap. <laughs> Come on, this isn't 3D, not in marvelous crap of vision. Um <laughs> Uh, God, I love Colin Mockery as Hollywood director. Um, where do I stand in terms of this, ad in, in terms of the book? Not, not the adaptation, it's coming out near the end of, you know, March, why I'm, this is, hence why I'm doing this video. Where do I stand with this book? Um, just right off the cuff. I thought it was somewhere between okay and average. I wasn't a huge fan by the end of it. Um, there were parts of it that I was really annoyed with. And there were certain things where I kept saying, this is an interesting concept, and I like the direction it's going in. This is an interesting idea. I, I like what it's going with. And, you know, I, I kept reading on and on and on. There were points where I wanted to stop and chuck the book out the window, but I said, no, maybe it will get better. Maybe it will actually build to something. And... I'm just going to say my interpretation of the novel, it's a video game. It's just one giant video game. And that was something I had to keep reminding myself because of the age the characters are and the situations they're in and the situations they get into and the way the whole world is set up. Um, I'm not going to spoil too much. I will be very, very light on them. Um, but if you haven't read it, uh, here's just the quick skim. It's the future where it's all grim, grimy, and desolate, and, you know, we pretty much polluted the planet, so we're living Wally, -E, except it's, like, trailer RVs on top of trailer RVs. You know, if you've seen the trailer of Ready Player One, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, so it's pretty much just, like, stacks of RVs on top of each other. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, you know, it's not perfect, but at least it's, you know, different than, say, flooding the entire planet. I'll take that any day. Um, and there's this kid named Wade Watts, and he is an orphan, so it's the Cinderella story! Ooh! Ugh. And in this world, in this desolate future, this, you know, bleak dystopia, everyone is glued in to this internet-like system called the Oasis, which is a giant RP video game virtual reality console where you can be anything, you can change what you are, you don't have to look like this, you can, like, you know, I don't know, maybe stretch your nose out and stuff like that. Um, you can be different characters. Okay. All right, fine. That's not a bad idea. Um, this has been done before with stuff like The Matrix and other things and other properties. It's nothing 100% new, uh, but at least it's done in an interesting manner. Um, the character, of course, is part of this Easter egg hunt, because apparently the creator of this virtual reality network internet system 
um, called the Oasis, uh, passes away at some point, and he leaves behind this giant video game tournament. <coughs> Sorry, crumbs in the back of my throat. Where if you pass through these three gates, no, no, you have to find the key to these gates. And you're supposed to go through them, and once you go through all three, like, levels and stuff, um, you get an inheritance of half a billion dollars from the creator's estate, and also complete control of the Oasis, and there's this evil corporation that's trying to get in, and, you know, have their control of the Oasis, and turn it into a freeway with many monies and stuff, and charge up the rent, and... Yeah, it's it's that kind of story. It's fight the system meets Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory meets Cinderella Man story. It's all these different things going into it. And I really want to go in in deep deep detail about everything, but like I said, I would have to spoil a good a good bulk of the book. Um so I'm just going to be very very light on what there is. Just just really, really light on concepts and stuff. Uh, here, here's what I liked. I liked the idea of this network. I liked the idea of there's these this entire internet kind of system where you can be anything and do anything. And there's this sense where it is real and how people are so glued to it. And I can understand why folks would want to go into this kind of system because it's cool. It's a giant video game system. It's more... We've come so far with virtual reality, and this is a really scary thought. What if we are really glued to our computers and phones and stuff like this? I think in relation, there's a quote from Ray Bradbury that goes, if we keep, I don't know really off the top of my head, but I think what he was pretty much saying was, if we keep using our devices and toys, we're going to be stuck to them for a long time. And as you can see, it's it's already happening. It's a bit of a scary thought. Um, and... I like the idea that there are these different characters that the Wade person runs into. Um, there's this blogger girl that's like, you know, really tough and stuff. Uh, there's this friend he has of his who's like, you know, really, yeah, bro, how you doing, bro? And there's this big twist with him that's actually kind of neat. Um, again, I don't want to ruin it, but I... I liked the idea of the twist, I just wish it would explore it a little better, and hopefully the movie does that, which it looks like it will. Um, I liked the Japanese Samurai Brothers, I thought they were actually kind of interesting. Um, so it's not like there's nothing to do, it's definitely throwing ideas in. Um, the problem with these ideas is that it feels like what Ernest Klein was doing, the author, and don't get me wrong, I've not met the guy, um, I'm sure he's a nice person, the last I checked he was doing a huge film festival down in, um, the Alamo Theater, I think it is, uh, the Alamo Draft House, the Alamo Draft House, he's like a little, uh, mini marathon, which looks so cool, even though there's a couple of titles I wish he put in there, like the Dark Crystal, but it's his marathon, whatever, um, I feel like there were times when he's doing this story, he's either throwing stuff in to see if it sticks, and most of the time there are certain points where this world has absolutely free reign and free rules that you could easily see that you can easily see things like defeated um, in different uh, iterations. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, okay, let me put it like this. There's a moment where one of the characters, like, beats, I think, like, maybe the second level, and he's given a choice of a robot, and in that selection is the Iron Giant. Um, the kid does not pick the Iron Giant. He picks some obscure robot character, whatever. It's, you know, a giant 80s reference. Okay, from my point of view, just strategic-wise, I would have picked the fucking Iron Giant. <laughs> that thing is unstoppable! <laughs> Haven't you seen the movie? You know, you blow him off, he regenerates and, like, connects himself together, and when his parts come off, he comes back on. He's a giant walking gun. <laughs> mm, missed opportunity. Durr. But uh, the, the, the sequence where it leads to is still kind of cool, but all the time I'm just thinking to myself, dude, you should have gotten the Iron Giant, not this, I don't know, Spider-Man sensei, whatever it was. 
Ugh. It really annoys me when stuff like that happens, because you can picture yourself, you know, yelling at the character, don't go for that direction, go, don't go for that, go for this one, because, you know, it would make more sense during the, this big, heavy, like, battle sequence and stuff, and, um, when you really look back at it, I feel like there's two objectives the book is having. One is being a giant video game, which it's already played out that way, especially with the whole idea where, you know, if you play this character all the way at the end, you'll get the girl, Ooh. Um, and this is the other thing that bugs me, too. It's stuffed to the brim with so many 1980s pop culture references, and I like that. I'm all for references. I'm all for stuff like that, um, but there's a difference between references and in-jokes, and... I think I'm more of the guy that likes in-jokes better, because when you pick them up, like, on the fly, it feels like an achievement in a sense. It's kind of interesting, like, oh, hey, I remember that line. You know, that's kind of a neat little subtle way. This book is not subtle at all with the 80s references. It goes... Uh, every single moment, it feels like it. Like, when he meets a character, they start quoting Highlander and stuff like that. Um... So it really does feel like an endurance test from time to time because it's so stuff with like 80s reference, 80s reference, 80s reference. Oh, it wasn't, wasn't it cool when we had like arcade games? Oh, isn't it great you know, that we originally had this and all that? And like the Amiga system and the Atari system and uh, and, the, and the way the, the game stages are played out, I like, <laughs> I kind of laughed a little because I like the buildup to it and the direction it goes into felt kind of underwhelming. Um, again, without giving too much away, when Wade finds the first gate, it's in this, like, Dungeons and Dragons, like, a th like thing, which is really cool. And then he meets up with this wizard, and the wizard's all like, oh, in order to get, like, the key to the next level, you must beat me in this Atari game! And they actually play an Atari game! And it's, ah! And it's like that throughout the rest of the book. It's like, mm. Uh, like, you know, there's show and don't tell, and a lot of this book, I, I'd say a good bulk of it until, like, certain sections here and there, are very much tell and don't show. Like, when they're going into the detail where the main character is role-playing, like, certain movies and you know playing video games here and there they don't go in the skinny of how the levels are played out or anything it's just i'm set up as this character and then it immediately jumps to near the end it's like no i want to live in that moment i want to know what that character is playing and going through and um it, it's more effective when you're reading a sequence where your character is playing the game, and I, I understand, you know, it can be very tedious and repetitive um, to do the same thing over and over again, but at the very least, it would have been more interesting to have an entire sequence of, I don't know, maybe the character um, doing a short version of the gameplay or something like that. There, There's a lack of tension here and there, except for the big battle scene at the tail end, um, it really feels like this character is like, oh, I know this, so I have no problems going through this uh, level and so-and-so. They, they do throw a couple of curveballs, I think, near the second um, near the second gate. Well, not the second gate, but preluding to the discovery of the second gate where he's um, doing this and this and this. Uh, I feel like there's just a lack of tension here and there. There's moments where... There is a sense where there could be dread and could be something, but then at the same time, um, it feels like kind of a buzzkill when you have a setup and then it immediately cuts after to the end of it. Like, oh, you know, I just went through that. It seemed like difficult, but you know what? I made it through. Yay. And at the end of the day, I want to root for the character. I really want to feel for the character. And I think what made the, the battle scene near the end worked with the, the giant robots and stuff is that the uh, is that Klein went into detail about the sequence and the battle and what was going on, um, and a lot of the book is not like that. There are times where instead there'll be like huge exposition dumps, you know, explaining this, explaining that, uh, the fact that 
people in the oasis that are looking for like the the easter egg um are known as like gunters because they're hunters looking for an easter egg or there's the history of the creator of the oasis jim Hall uh, halliday and stuff like that and it it feels like it's just one giant exposition dump i feel like it would have been more interesting if it was placed maybe in a dialogue session or um, maybe the Wade character is doing extra research and comes across the kind of material. Because when you have, like, pages of nothing but explaining this and explaining that, explaining this, explaining that, it's either going to feel like one giant history textbook of boredom, or it's just going to be little to no interesting. Because um, when you have the trouble of explaining how the world works, instead of just having the character go through and experience these things... It really feels like such a slog to get through, and that's what the first 100, 100 pages were for me. When something was happening, when something was going on, and the villain of the evil corporation was doing things, that's where I thought it got interesting. That's when I thought it kind of kicked up in the gear. You have this the head of this evil like um, business or whatever, that's like Belloc from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, I thought he was interesting, but even then, there's so little of him. That they could have made them like this huge big threat. Maybe they'll do that in the movie. I hope they do. Um, and there are times... This is something that a lot of people online have picked out. Um, especially certain articles. There are certain spots in this book where I felt it was taken a little out of context. But I can see why it'd be taken out of context. Uh, most cringeworthy is the relationship between this girl he meets. Who's this very famous blogger. And because he never met her in person, he has kind of these little puppy love feelings for her. And the way he talks about it, can either be like, oh, that's so tragically cute, or, oh, wait, oh, oh, God, no, you're, you're, you're a stalker, Wade. You're, you're a stalker. <laughs> he even mentioned at one point, I've been cyber stalking you. Um, this is a bit of a minor spoiler, but it is, it's to be expected with romances like this because, you know, they're online stuff. I I can understand why the author would go in this kind of direction because one it's referencing that trope where the two love at first sight couples don't know if they should pursue a relationship or not but then um, they have that small realization where it's like oh we can't be together because of so and so and this sort of reason um, again this is a small spoiler but it's to be expected and so you can probably expect where it goes there is a breakup. And I don't think it was handled well. I really don't think it was handled well. If I was writing this sequence, I would probably make it softer. I would really try to have the two of them realize, yeah, it makes sense why we can't have this kind of thing. Not this big, harsh, oh, you don't understand it. You know, you're just over there and I'm over here. We never met in person, so it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't count and blah, blah, blah. I think if I was writing that sequence, I would make it more human. I would make it more realistic. I would have her say, wait a minute. You're good as a friend, but really think about it. We have not met in person. Uh, and yeah, he defends and stuff. I think it would have made more sense if she didn't go into like this big, you know, I'm breaking up with you. Um, okay, it's not done that way, but it would have been kind of funny if it was. I think the point I'm trying to make is when you have scenes like that, you either make it harsh or uh, sinister. And I think because you really want to root for these characters and want to see them together, I think it would have been more interesting if it was done in a more human kind of way. Like, hey, let's step back a second. You know, look at this. Look at that. Um, it's clear why this won't work. You know, maybe after the big gate a thing or whatever you know we could try it but right now let's just you know have our distance and stuff they don't need this big breakup thing come on um oh god what else to talk about oh yeah the other uh, this is another thing that's got has been out of context too there are points when klein doesn't know when to limit himself and this comes into play in one of the most cringeworthy moments which i'll try to keep pg third pg level as i can um there is a moment where the Wade character becomes a shut-in, and he's pretty much like, every geek online who's glued to his computer and doesn't go outside. And it's like, okay, that's interesting. That's a little bit of a dark twist. Um, and the, he and Klein goes as far 
as to have the Wade character have, oh God, a virtual adult, I'm going to say pleasure toy. Um, it's, uh, details are vague. <laughs> It's it's in the form of this doll, which he uses in the virtual reality to get laid. That's about as basic as I can get. Um, so then the joke where it's like, yeah, you know, it's not like the real thing, so I threw it out in the trash, and now I just spanked the monkey. Okay, so funny joke, you know that if if it ended right there, it would have been you know, a bit of a funny joke. But no, he has to go in this entire detailed importance about how self-pleasure is like one of the most greatest bodily functions to, uh, bodily functions to ever exist and I I already read up about it on certain um, articles critiquing and criticizing the book so I knew that was to come um <laughs> crap yeah. so seeing the context and where it is I think it would have been better if they didn't have that extra bit of elaboration. I think it would have been better if they didn't have that in. And there's points where completely different tangents go off out of nowhere, like explaining like Wade's view of the universe and his philosophy on life and stuff like that. I can do without that. We already get that in the very first chapter. Um, yeah, I... I, I hope the movie's good. I hope the movie's better. I really do. Um, is this... Uh, would I recommend the book? Uh, it really depends on your angle. If you really want something that's along the lines of Tron meets the Matrix, uh, this is for you, I guess. If you like, you know, things... Stuff with 80s references and stuff, you know, I guess. Um, but just by how I'm describing it and talking about it, this would be hard to recommend for everyone because as you know there are folks that have torn us the shreds it's getting like really panned so far from what i've seen on twitter and stuff um it's weird considering the progression it's gone from being like you know this really beloved artifact to like wait a minute that's that's not right something's not right something's wrong something's wrong Nope, not genius. Not genius at all. Ah, uh ah. -uh. Nope, nope. No way. No how. Um. So, yeah. From my point of view, it's fine. I mean, if I was in college and reading this, or if I was in high school reading it, um, I probably would have liked it better. Um, but I will say, though, this book accomplished the unthinkable. It accomplished one thing that I didn't think it would accomplish. It wanted me to read more Stephen King. <laughs> Because as I was reading this book and seeing these big blobs of, like, exposition, it reminded me of Stephen King's It, where even King would go on, like, these long-winded tangents about, like, the history of Derry, Maine, and how it's evil and stuff like that. And as long-winded as they are, they were interesting. Um, even when it went on for too long, I still read it, and I thought, wow, this is an interesting look into the history of the town and stuff like that. It's not perfect, but... It's interesting, and it's building this entire universe and world that uh, King is building and stuff like that. Even if it was far-fetched, it was still interesting, and, you know, I didn't want to put it down. Ready Player One, I was just skimming pages. I was like, oh, great, acquisition dump. Uh, blah, 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 that's kind of important. Blah, 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 that's kind of important. Oh, this is about the catalyst, whatever it is. Okay, that's kind of important. Um, I don't think it's a bad book, but it's the first one Ernest Klein did, and I can kind of see why people are harping on it. I know from a fact, because when you're doing something for the first time, it's either going to be lightning in a bottle perfect, or it's going to be imperfect. Believe me, I know from experience. Uh, when I was doing vaulting, season one wasn't, you know, up to snub, but I kept going at it. I did season two, season three, and, you know... I learned from there exactly what style and attitude I want to wanted to take the show in. Um, I don't think Ernest Klein has written anything else aside from a couple of screenplays and stuff, that Armada thing. Uh, hopefully the, the movie's going to be better. I'm really looking forward to it. It, it looks like it could be fun. Uh, Steven Spielberg can't do wrong. <laughs> yeah, the BFG sucked, but... Uh, so I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, not a great book, but... 
I'm glad I read it just to get an opinion out there. So it didn't kill me. Still here, still alive. And I will, I definitely can't wait to see what uh, unfolds on March 29th or if there's a Thursday screening, can't wait to see it then. So with that said, I'm going to leave it at that and I'll uh, see you on the next upload.